How y'all doing? You're the uh, 7 o'clock service. Did you have dinner beforehand? Yes? Anyone having dinner after this, late night dinner? Okay, awesome, fantastic. Well, uh, so glad you can make it out for our Good Friday service. It's always interesting, isn't it, to come into Good Friday. It's sometimes you're not sure. Do you say Happy Good Friday? Uh, and it's always unique because, you know, we know what happened on this Friday in, in history as Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins. And in some sense, it's, it's a somber day, a solemn day, but we do know that because of what happened on that cross, we can call it good. And so we're so thankful for what Jesus has done for us. And we're going to um, lean into that a little bit more tonight as we look at the scriptures. So Pastor Rob uh, is going to come up after our first song of worship and sort of explain a little bit of the flow of service that we're going to have this evening. But just before we um, get into worship, did you guys get our email? Awesome. So we are having a uh, little change up on our Easter Sunday. Rather than having one big outdoor service at 10 a.m., which was uh, because of the rain we had to move, we're moving inside. And so we'll have three services on Sunday morning, one at 8.30. Who's going to come to 8.30? A couple of you. All right. All you early. See, you're late. You're late now, but then you'll be early then. Uh, Seven, uh, 8.30, and then we've got our 10 o'clock service, so if you are already planning to come at 10, just come at 10. And then we've got another one at 11.30. So 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Choose whichever service works well for you, and uh, we'll have a great morning on Sunday celebrating our risen Savior. Amen? Amen. Well, hey, would you join me uh, standing as we enter into a time of worship? I'll pray for us, and then uh, we'll... We'll sing some songs to Jesus. So, Lord God, thank you so much for this night. Lord, we thank you for what you did on this day in history as we look back in faith to what you did on the cross. And Lord, we know that our faith is based upon that evidence, Lord, that you really did die. You really did pay for our sins there, Jesus. And we recognize that fact. And Lord, I pray that we would all come here tonight, Lord, contemplating what that means for us, Lord, and how we can live under that reality. Lord Jesus, thank you that you didn't stay dead, but three days later you rose from the dead, and we can't wait to celebrate that this Sunday. But right now, as we just have a time of reflection upon, um, upon the cross, Lord, I pray that we would draw near to you. And Lord, you promise in your word that if we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And so meet us in this time and in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.
message uh, tonight. God, would you speak through um, our speakers tonight, Lord? And would you do a good work in us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, and that's what we're here to do tonight, is to all hail King Jesus. Um, so let me uh, give a little introduction here. This is a very special day, special because it marks the day 2,000 years ago that Jesus died for all of our sins, past, present, and future. So in order to help us hopefully grow in our appreciation for and, under, and understanding of this day and all that it means. We're going to focus on a little section of Scripture in Matthew 17, verses 15 through 23. So if you could turn with me in your Bibles to that, that would be great. And as you're turning there, these verses give us the account of that great crowd that was in Jerusalem for that Passover, and that crowd that made a choice that reflected the sinful nature from which we all suffer but which God miraculously used to bring about our own salvation. So let me read these eight verses uh, for us now. Follow along with me, please. Matthew 27, 15. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would open up the truth of your word uh, to us this evening, Lord. Take us back in time, place us in that crowd, Lord, that we may have a deeper understanding of what really occurred, that we may see our role in what is about to happen. Lord, we thank you for what you did on that night, Lord. We will be eternally grateful for it. We will be singing praises to you around your throne in heaven forever as the Lamb who is slain on our behalf. Amen. So as Daniel said, I was going to explain kind of the order of service. There'll be three of us speaking tonight. I'm going to speak first and talk about verses 15 through 17. Ryan Reeves, our youth pastor, will speak, on, will speak second and talk about verses 17 through 19. And then Daniel uh, will be covering verses 20 to 23. And in essence, I'm going to be presenting the problem, the problem of sin the dark backdrop of all the consequences of our sin against which the gospel must be seen in order to see it in all of its glory. Ryan's going to present the, the righteous one, present Jesus, who's the solution to the problem that I'm going to present. And then Daniel is going to pre present the choice that we all have before us to choose Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So let me take a moment and set the stage for what's going on here, so hopefully it'll come to life for you more. Um, it's Passover time. Uh, Passover was something that was first done about 1,200 years earlier. It had been designed by God to give a covering for his people when that last and tenth plague was going to come over the Egyptians to cause Pharaoh to set his people free. And that plague was the plague of death. And God said he was going to strike the firstborn in every household. But to make a provision for his own to give them a covering from that judgment in many ways picturing what was going to happen on the cross 1,200 years later, God instituted the first Passover so that the firstborn in each Hebrew household would not die. That first Passover is recorded for us in Exodus 12, and in it God commanded each family to take a one-year-old male lamb. 
that was without blemish, which is going to picture the perfect innocence of Christ that you're going to hear about tonight. And the head of the household was then to slay that lamb at twilight, which is as the sun is going down, which is precisely the time that Jesus gave up his spirit on this Passover that we're talking about. The blood of the lamb was then to be drained out and put into a basin. And the head of the household was then to take the branch of what's called a hyssop tree and dip it in the blood. And let me explain to you for a moment what hyssop is. Hyssop is a parsley-type tree that grows in that part of the world. Our parsley plants are little things, but they had big trees full of something similar there. And parsley or hyssop, when it's dried, acts like a paintbrush. It can absorb liquid, and so it would absorb the blood when it was dipped into that, that basin. And then the head of the household was to take the branch of the hyssop tree that had been dipped in the basin and paint it on the doorposts, which are the uprights of the doorframe, and the lintel, which is the cross beam across the two doorposts, much like the sign of the cross. And God said that when death then swept through the land, that when he saw the doorpost and the lintel painted with the blood of this unblemished lamb, that he would pass over that home and death would not hit their home. And in like manner, when God sees the blood of Jesus Christ over our hearts, we are spared from that judgment for our sin that we're going to hear about tonight. Hyssop then goes on to play a very important role all through the Mosaic sacrificial system. They use hyssop everywhere. And on this day on the cross, when they reached the sour wine up to Jesus, make note it was with the branch of a hyssop tree because hyssop from this point forward in Passover has always been associated with sacrifice. As a result of doing this first Passover, Exodus 12.23 tells us here is what would happen in that Hebrew home. It says, For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. The Bible tells us that this all took place on the 10th day of the first month in the Hebrew calendar, and that was the month of Nisan, and it would roughly correspond to late March, early April of our calendar, the season that we're in right now. In the next verse, Exodus 12, 24, God commanded that his people observe this event as a religious rite every year. So now... Back to Matthew 27, at the time we're looking at here, there were probably upwards of a million Jewish pilgrims coming from all over Israel into Jerusalem and who had traveled there that week to celebrate this event in obedience to God's command. Each family would have had with it a lamb, so that probably means there was at least a quarter of a million lambs roaming through the streets of Jerusalem at that time. So let's now look at verse 15. I'll read it again, and then we'll try to dig into it in some detail. First verse, now at the feast, and that's this feast of Passover, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. So we see here that the Roman governor of Jerusalem, who was Pontius Pilate at this time, apparently had a custom that each Passover he would release to the crowd a prisoner that they wanted. And Rome generally had a lot of prisoners all slated for crucifixion because that was the way Rome deterred rebellion and crime. And they had, you could walk into many Roman cities and see people crucified along the roadside just to remind you who was in control here. We're not told why this custom existed or why Pilate had it, but it was most likely a form of crowd control because the Roman governor and all of his occupying troops were always living under the threat of a possible Jewish uprising. And this particular week, they would have been undoubtedly on very high alert for any possible unrest or rebellion because they had a million more people coming into the city. Now, while there's no mention of this particular custom anywhere else really in the world except the Bible, we do know that from Roman history that Rome did something similar like this in many of the cities that it conquered and used it as a method of crowd control. When the city would have one of their indigenous festivals, the governors would release some prisoner just to kind of release the tension and, and, and calm things down a bit. And so most likely Pilate was just doing what any good Roman governor would have done in any, any city that Rome 
had conquered. Verse 16, it says, And they had then a notorious prisoner, that would be in this bunch of prisoners, called Barabbas. And we know they had a bunch because there was two others crucified along with Jesus that day. But this verse tells us that amongst that bunch of prisoners that the Romans were holding was this one man named Barabbas. And we're told there that Barabbas was a notorious prisoner. That's an important word to zero in on, notorious, because that would have meant that he was quite well known. He was probably a prize catch for the Romans to have captured him. And in Greek, the word that's translated as notorious, and particularly in the context that's used here, referred to someone who was famous, but in a bad sense. Famous, but in a negative sense. In other words, as we might say in English, infamous. That's who Barabbas was. We know some things about the crimes he committed that caused him to be such a notorious criminal from the other Gospels. Luke 23, 18 and Mark 15, 7 tell us that he was an insurrectionist and also a murderer. Now, an insurrectionist was someone who was trying to overthrow the Roman rulers of Jerusalem. So an insurrectionist at heart was a rebel. A murderer, of course, has always been regarded in almost all cultures as the most despicable of all criminals. And Barabbas was both, rebel and a murderer. John 18.40 also tells us that Barabbas was a robber. So insurrection, rebellion, murder, and robbery, that's who this man was. Let's look at verse 17 then. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? So here we see that in fulfillment of Pilate's custom of letting one prisoner of the crowd's choosing go free, Pilate gave them a choice. Who do you want it to be, this notorious Barabbas or Jesus? And as we will see later in the text, the crowd chose Barabbas. But honestly, that should not surprise us because as we saw this last Palm Sunday, this crowd, this was the same crowd there at Palm Sunday, this crowd was ready and willing and able to start a rebellion against Rome. That's what they wanted to do. And Barabbas was a rebel against Rome. He was the kind of guy they would choose. He was just what they wanted because he was just like them. Sadly, a Jesus who could heal them, feed them, raise their dead, cast out demons, but who also said to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's was not what they wanted. That was not good enough for them, for Jesus was not a rebel. Now, Barabbas may have been notorious, as the text says here, for the specific crimes that he had committed, but his basic nature that led him to commit those crimes was anything but notorious. Rather, it was common to all of us. Because you see, Barabbas was a human being just like us and with a sin nature just like us. Now, of course, many of us here may not have acted out on our sin nature in the same way that Barabbas did because the laws of the land tend to restrict that and maybe our parents restricted that and general morality restricts it. But each one of us, this is important to remember, to put yourself in that crowd, each one of us is still capable of doing all the things that Barabbas did because we have the same type of heart that he had. Now, if that shocks you that I would say that, don't take my word for it. Take God's word for it because that's what his word says. Let me quickly walk you through some places where we see this from the very beginning of the Bible. All the way back in Genesis 3, we see that the very first human beings were insurrectionists or rebels against the rule of God in their lives. In fact, back then, there was just one simple little rule. Don't eat of the fruit of this one tree. And they could not keep even that one simple little rule because they were rebels. They also showed that instead of listening to God and his truth, which was that if they ate that fruit, they would surely die, They would rather listen to another voice, the voice of Satan, who is pictured there in the form of a serpent, and to the many lies of of, of the serpent about both God and his word. And so when they then ate, as those rebels listening to the lies of Satan, 
That bite they took was literally heard round the world and still plagues us to this day. In that sense also, Adam and Eve were both robbers and murderers in that they went along with Satan in robbing God of his authority over their lives and in slandering the goodness and reputation of God, which is essentially what slander is. It's murdering someone's character. And just as Adam and Eve were the physical parents of us all, their evil choice became the spiritual parent of all of our evil choices. And so God goes on in Scripture to diagnose the human heart this way. Both before the flood, it says in Genesis 6, 5, that he saw our hearts as evil and wicked. And then even after the flood, when he started again, we're told in Genesis 8, 21, that our hearts were still evil and wicked. So much so that by the time of the prophet Jeremiah, he said this in Jeremiah 17, 9, reflecting God's view of us, that our hearts are deceitful and sick. Jesus said this in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. So you see, brothers and sisters, Barabbas was just like one of us in that we share the same problem with him, and that is the problem of our heart. As a result of this sinful state, the Bible tells us a number of things, a number of consequences happen to us besides death. Colossians 1, and 22, along with Ephesians 2, 12, say that we were alienated or separated from God. Romans 5.10 says that we were enemies of God. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says that we were spiritually dead. And Colossians 3, 5 to 7 says that we were therefore rightfully under God's holy wrath. In short, much like Barabbas, we were judged, sentenced, and condemned criminals. In any other mind but the marvelous mind of God, we, like Barabbas, would not have been worth dying for. Yet, as Romans 5.8 says, Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. That is what makes Good Friday so good. So you see, this is truly a good day for bad people like you and me. Because by coming to Jesus in faith and trusting in what he did on that first Good Friday to save us from our wretched condition, we can be made completely clean, justified in God's sight. Let me close and summarize by reading this portion of Scripture from 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, which pretty much sums it all up. It says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then listen to this great news. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. If you want to stand for our next song of worship.
Lord, thank you for washing us clean. We were stained by sin, Lord. We couldn't save ourselves. But you came and you made us clean by your blood. We're so thankful. Pray that you would be filling Ryan up as he gives the second part of our Good Friday message. Would we receive your word tonight? In Jesus' name. Amen. It's so good to be with you all tonight. So we're going through Matthew 27, verses 17 through 19. Let's just jump right in. So verse 17 reads, So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Moving on, For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Let's pray. Jesus, I I pray that you would reveal to us by your Holy Spirit just how righteous you are. God, we are Barabbas. We're the, the sinners, but you are the righteous one, the sinless one, and I pray that that would be just made known right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so now that we've looked at the sinfulness of Barabbas and Rob thankfully did some of the dirty work and now I get to talk about how amazing Jesus is. Now that we've looked at the sinfulness of Barabbas, let's contrast that with the righteousness and the perfection of Jesus. So back to verse 17. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? So this story of Pilate is actually in all four Gospels. And if you look at all four Gospels, you can find, as Rob pointed out, that Barabbas was actually four things. He was a notorious prisoner. He had murdered somebody in an uprising, so that made him a rebel. And he was also a thief. So Jesus' life and his behaviors were the exact opposite of this. And there's many verses to prove this, but there are two that I want to look at right now. So the first is Luke 4, 18 through 19. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Barabbas was a prisoner, and Jesus came to set you and me free from sin, because we're prisoners to sin. The second verse is John 10, 9 through 10, and it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Barabbas was a thief, but Jesus came to give life and life abundantly. So just to recap, Barabbas was first a prisoner, but Jesus came to set the captives free. Barabbas was a murderer, but Jesus came and he raised people like Lazarus and Jairus' daughter from the dead. Three, Barabbas was a rebel, but when the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus to get him to say something against Rome... He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And then last and fourth, Barabbas was a thief, but Jesus came to give the abundant life. So if Barabbas is a picture of sinfulness, Jesus is the opposite, perfect righteousness. Moving on to verse 18, it reads, For he knew, talking about Pilate, that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. So Pilate knew that Jesus was not guilty. He knew the envious intentions of the religious leaders. For instance, this is in John 19, 6 through 7. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. 
So the religious leaders here are saying that the big law that Jesus broke was that he was who he said he was. I mean, talk about righteousness, right? The the only thing that Jesus did wrong was that he said he was who he said he was. That's the only thing they could find against him. They were just envious that he had this huge following, that he did all of these miracles, that he was the one. So that's why they delivered him up. And then moving to the last verse, it says, Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. So even the words judgment seat here stick out to me. Pilate was judging from a man's perspective, a self-interested perspective. But one day, God will judge on an eternal judgment seat. Jesus will sit on an eternal judgment seat and he will judge rightly according to his righteousness. So Barabbas was evil, but Jesus was perfectly righteous. Even Pilate, And his wife recognized this. But do we? Why don't you stand for our next song? Sorrow, son of suffering, see blood and tears, blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who reached for me. Your stripes, my healing, 
There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who will reach for me. sacrifice for all of our sins and we are so thankful pray that the word that Daniel's going to preach would be landing on good soil and we know that it does not return void or empty so we love you we thank you for this time in Jesus name amen 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 thanks guys all right well good evening so You guys have that sense in your mind right now of the sinfulness of Barabbas and the righteousness of Jesus. You've got both of those kind of, right, juxtaposed in your mind right there. As we are going to continue reading in our text this evening, we're going to now look at the choice that was made between Jesus and Barabbas. So would you read with me? From Matthew chapter 27, we're going to look at verses 20 to 23. This is what it says. Now, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? And they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you on this Good Friday, knowing, Lord, that you were crucified. And Lord, you stretched out those hands upon the cross because you love us. And Lord, we look upon it with wonder, Uh, Even in a sense, it it just, it it seems wrong. It seems backwards that the innocent one would die for the guilty one. And yet this is the good news, Lord. This is what we believe brings eternal salvation to our souls. So Jesus, as we draw near to you and as we consider the cross and what you did for us there uh, on this day, Lord, would we just be so grateful, Jesus, We love you, Lord. We pray it in your name. Amen. All right, so this evening we've had set before us two different men. We have Jesus, who's called the Christ, and we have this man named Barabbas. And as we compare the two, uh, there's actually some similarities. And one of the uh, biggest similarities that we see between the two is their names. You know, Jesus is called the Son of God. 
But if you translate Barabbas, his name is Bar, which means son, and Abbas, which is the word for father, Barabbas is the son of the father. And there's actually some ancient manuscripts of Matthew that'll even include Jesus with the name Barabbas. It was Jesus Barabbas and Jesus the Christ. And so in a very ironic, almost kind of eerie way, we see that these two men set before us have the same name and the same sort of sense of who they are. They're both Jesus, the Son of God. And yet there's far more differences between the two than there are similarities. Rob has already shared with you the sinfulness of Barabbas, that he was a notorious murder and thief and an insurrectionist. He, he had every reason to be in prison. You know, it was the cross that was designed for men like Barabbas who rebelled against Rome. You know, Crucifixion was something that the Romans invented, and, and many people died upon crosses. Jesus wasn't the only one to ever die upon a cross. And in those days, if you saw a cross, it, was almost, it would almost function like a billboard in Rome that would tell you, this is what happens to you if you mess with Rome. And that is the cross that Barabbas would have deserved as a prisoner, as a thief, as a murderer, as an insurrectionist. It, it, you could even consider as the crosses that were on that hill called Golgotha or Calvary. There were three of them, right? There was uh, on the left and the right of Jesus, there were people that were on their crosses for their crimes. And that middle cross, we could almost uh, take a step and say that cross was meant for Barabbas. Should have been his name that was put on a plaque and nailed to the top of that cross. But then we saw how Ryan shared with you about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What a kind and merciful, gracious man that he was. He, he was a teacher in Israel who, you know, no one could uh, f really figure out a way to catch him, you know. Always they were astounded with the things that he would say as he would, uh, you know, open his mouth and just speak beautiful things. And even in this moment, he doesn't even open his mouth to defend his own innocence. We'll even say Pilate say in our text, what evil has Jesus done? And, you know, there's crickets. There's nothing that they could say about Jesus except, right, what Ryan said is that he, he lived out what he claimed to be. And so in that sheer silence, when Pilate asked, what evil has Jesus done? Who, who do you want me to give to you, you know? Who, who do you want me to deliver? There was no answer, and yet they chose together with one voice to have Jesus release, or Barabbas release, and Jesus sentenced to death. They said, crucify him. But again, the cross was not, not meant for men like Jesus, a man of innocence, a man of righteousness. He didn't deserve to be punished. And so as we compare these two men, you know, the, the obvious choice ought to have been made. We, we, we should consider how, you know, it should have been Barabbas that would be crucified, not Jesus. And consider how all the stories that we love have this storyline of how, you know, good triumphs over evil. If you've been to the movies recently or you've watched any, you know, Marvel comic movie, they're all the same script, right? It's always this story of how the good people are spared from harm and the bad people are punished. And if we ever see a storyline kind of twisted and it doesn't follow that script, we're, we're like, what? This can't happen, right? And, and we understand that. Instinctually, as human beings, we understand that. And so Pilate tries to play into those instincts to give them what should have been an obvious choice. But again, guys, there's so much more that is at work in this story, and we're going to continue to look at it tonight. Look at verse 20. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. 
We know that it was out of envy that the chief priests and elders had Jesus arrested. And there was this brewing tension that was occurring in Israel at that time. There was tension between the religious authorities and the political authorities. And Jesus just seemed to get caught right in the middle of it. And the crowds were gathered there in Jerusalem. It was the the time of the feast. It was the high traffic time there in the streets of Jerusalem. And everyone was on high alert. You know, this was Pilate's biggest work week. And, And he would wake up early and he'd be out there, you know, sitting on his judgment seat, making sure things were kept in order. And you could just imagine the crowds gathering in the street, and, and there's tension. Nobody wants there to be an uprising. They're, they don't want anyone rebelling against Rome, and so they came up with this tradition, right? They're going to release a prisoner. Who do you want us to release? You? Just to kind of keep you all happy. So, you know, Pilate doesn't have a bad week on the job. And so the religious leaders, knowing that, and with envy in their heart, they're going amidst the crowd, persuading them not to rebel against Rome, but rather to destroy Jesus. What interesting words to put together, to destroy Jesus. So can you picture in your mind sort of this great multitude of people waiting sort of in this this gathering place, a courtyard or in the streets as Pilate is seated upon his judgment seat. They're sort of at the praetorium there where he would uh, give his sentencing and executing judgment. And there the people are waiting to find out who's going to be released. They want to know, you know, what, what, what's going to happen. And, and so the choice is presented. Do you want Jesus, who is the Christ, or do you want that notorious man named Barabbas? Who do you want? And the religious leaders had already persuaded the people to choose Barabbas. It's interesting because religion has a certain kind of persuasion over the masses of people. Politics also has a certain persuasion over the masses of people. And both of these are happening. Both of these are at play during this time as the choice should have been Jesus. But there's obviously these other things coming into play. There's sort of a religious mindset happening. You guys know what that religious mindset is, right? Which is that... Good things happen to good people. The religious mind says bad things happen to bad people. And when the religious mindset, though, when that gets influenced by sin like envy, things get all wonky, things get all weird. You can't keep things straight, and so it, things begin to turn on their head, and good is spoken of as evil, and evil is spoken of as good, and the religious leaders are sort of corruptly influencing the people in this direction to choose Barabbas over Jesus. What a foolish decision. What a foolish choice to make. And then in verse 21, the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. So foolish to ask for Barabbas over Jesus. But you see, that's what sin does to us. It just, sin is like Barabbas. We foolishly choose sin instead of Jesus. And the masses here being motivated by envy and murder, they're going to make the wrong choice And everything we've seen about Jesus and everything we've seen about Barabbas, the choice should be obvious, but the crowds are looking at Barabbas as sort of like this human leader that might be able to do something to get rid of Rome, you know? That's what they really want. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a leader of the people. Jesus was also a leader of the people. He was a human leader, but he was more than a human. He is God, and his mission on earth was to save humanity from sin and death and to bring about the kingdom of heaven. And on Palm Sunday, when they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, they were looking for an earthly leader. They didn't want Jesus to be their king in the sense that he came to be. See, the people foolishly chose Barabbas instead of Jesus because they were so earthly-minded, they weren't thinking about the things of heaven. 
And then in verse 22, Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? You know, I got this innocent man on my hands. What do you want me to do with him? And they all said, look at that, they all said, let him be crucified. You know, we read that and we kind of think about, you know, well, if I was there in that midst of that crowd, you know, I, I, I would say, release Jesus, <laughs> crucify Barabbas, right? If you were there, isn't that what you would do? You, you would be the one person who stands up in the midst and, no, no, you got it all wrong. Barabbas is the bad guy. Jesus is the good guy. Release Jesus. Don't, don't release Barabbas, right? That's if you were there, you would have stood up in the midst and said, release Jesus. Is that what you would have done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. No. We like to think that we would. I have a question for you. Who killed Jesus? Well, did the religious leaders kill Jesus? Certainly they had envy and murder in their heart and delivered him over to be crucified. Did the Roman government kill Jesus? Did Pilate kill Jesus? Yeah. Did the multitudes kill Jesus? Certainly, they're the ones crying out as one voice, let him be crucified. Did Barabbas kill Jesus? Yeah, in a sense, you know, he's the one that deserved to die that day. He knew that he should have been on that cross, but he let Jesus go to that cross. Barabbas, he should take responsibility. Who killed Jesus? Who will take responsibility for the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I'll tell you, you killed Jesus. I killed Jesus. You're like, well, hold on a minute. I wasn't there. So how could I have killed Jesus? I didn't kill Jesus. We all killed Jesus. Religion and government killed Jesus. Jews and Gentiles killed Jesus. Masses and individuals killed Jesus. We all, as sinners in this lost world, Together, we all did it. It was our sin that killed Jesus. Even as Peter will get up on the day of Pentecost and preach that first sermon to the church, he'll speak to that group and he'll say, you killed the author of life. You killed Jesus. See, your sin was there killing Jesus on the cross because Jesus died for all sin and that includes yours and that includes mine, that includes Barabbas's and Pilate's and Pilate's wife and, and those religious leaders and the chief priests and the scribes and everyone. Jesus died on the cross to bear the sins of humanity. It was our voice that was crying out with the midst of that crowd, calling for the death of an innocent man. If I were in that crowd, I would have said, let him be crucified. Why? Well, because if you think about it, it was the will of God that Jesus would be crucified. The Father in heaven said, let him be crucified. Jesus had to die on a cross. There's nothing that was going to stop him from dying on a cross. Consider Peter when he had just said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. He just got ding, ding, ding. Peter, you got it. You know who Jesus is. And then Jesus says, I'm going to, I'm going to be betrayed, arrested. I'm going to be uh, crucified. And, and, Jesus, and Peter's like, no, G Jesus, you are not getting crucified. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to make sure that you do not get crucified. And what did Jesus say to Peter? He said, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God. You're only thinking like a mere man. 
Because you see, it is that human mind that doesn't understand that Jesus needed to die on the cross because it was on the cross that God the Father took all sin, past, present, and future, and he placed it upon his son, and God the Father judged all of the sin of humanity in the body of his only begotten son so that we who are like Barabbas, who should have been dying on the cross, we get to be set free. We get to set, be set free as though we were innocent. See, that cross was meant for Barabbas. That cross was meant for me. That cross was meant for you. But Jesus took our place and died on a cross that he did not deserve. Jesus chose to bear our well-deserved cross for the sake of our redemption. You see, the Father treated Jesus like Barabbas so that he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sakes he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, what was meant to destroy all of humanity, it, 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 dest it would destroy religion and politics, it would destroy Jews or Gentiles, it would destroy the masses and the individuals what, what destroys humanity is sin and death, and we all deserve it. But instead, Jesus was destroyed. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he died in our place. That's the good news. I, again, going back to those words that Peter said on the day of Pentecost, you killed the author of life. But he says after that, but God raised him up. You know, Jesus died on Friday, but it doesn't end on Friday. You know that Jesus rose on a Sunday. And so while the story might not all make sense today, when you see that Jesus did die and it really did pay for the sins of the world, being proved by his resurrection, this is the best story ever told. This is the story where good triumphs over evil. What man meant for evil, God intends for good. This is the story that, yes, in a very paradoxical, turned up on its head kind of way, this is the best story that has ever been told. And we love this story. For those who believe this story is true and historical, and they believe it with faith, to us it's eternal life. In verse 23, Pilate said, why? Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Can you hear your own voice in the midst of that crowd? What if that question were asked about Barabbas? Why? What evil has he done? Oh, we'd be able to give a whole list of things that Barabbas had done as evil. What if that question was asked about you? What, what evil has he done? What evil has she done? There'd be all kinds of things that we could say. Because we have all sinned, we have all fallen short of the glory of God, there'd be at least a few things on the list. But Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we've heard this story, and like any story, we oftentimes want to see ourselves in it. Where do you see yourself in this story? Well, perhaps you're like the religious. You know, you, you carry that mindset that, you know, good people have good things happen to them. And bad things happen to bad people. 
And, and you're not bad, right? You're, you're good. Well, at least your good outweighs your bad. And if your good outweighs your bad, then, then, you're, then you're a good person. And you live with this mindset that, that, if, that if I can just tip the scales to where my good is going to outweigh my bad, then I'm, I'm good with God. That's just not how God operates. That's a religious mindset that God does not receive. Or, or maybe you're like the crowd. You're, you're persuaded by the passions. You, you see all sort of the, the things going on around you, the religions and the politics and all the, the flow and the sway of the world, and you're kind of like trying to figure out like, where, where, like what's happening, where's everything going, where, where are people going, and just sort of see the masses, and, and, it's, and you'll just, okay, we're going this way, and you go that way, and you just follow in that broad way that leads to destruction, and you just go with the flow. You just don't want to disrupt anything. You know, you're just you're part of the crowd. If everyone's saying, crucify him, you say, okay, crucify him. And you just go along with what you, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to stand out. Or, or you're like Pilate. You know, Pilate's a very interesting character in this story. He was very intrigued by Jesus. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're here and you're very intrigued about Jesus. There's something about this guy. Can't quite put your finger on it, but he's, he's got this authority. He's got this power. He he's, he's, seems to be like a really good person. He's, he's even innocent. Like, what has he done? And you know all the facts about Jesus, but, but you... In knowing the facts about Jesus, you have failed to make a decision of faith. You don't have any backbone to actually look at the facts and decide for Jesus. You know, he asked this question, what should I do with Jesus? You know what he should have done with Jesus? He should have believed in him and received him as Lord and Savior, not just be intrigued by him and then wipe his hands clean when things didn't you know, go his way. Or, or maybe you're like Barabbas. Oh, <laughs> I'm like Barabbas. We're all like Barabbas. Sinners, deserving of death. But thanks be to God that Jesus died in Barabbas' place. He got to be set free. You know, there is something that we could commend about Barabbas. There is something that he did that, that, that we can come in. He accepted the freedom that was afforded to him by Jesus taking his place on the cross. He took the freedom that was offered by Jesus taking his place. And, and we don't know how Barabbas responded, whether he just sort of got released from prisons and was like, well, I'm, I'm good, I, I can just go now. And just walks away and like, thank you. And then you don't see him anymore. Or perhaps, and the Bible doesn't tell us, so it would only be speculation, but perhaps Barabbas was so moved by what had just happened that he ended up believing in Jesus. Maybe he saw Jesus hanging on the cross. He's like, I should have been there. I look forward to going to heaven and perhaps, you know, walking up to somebody and, and you know, oh, hi, Daniel. And the I'm Barabbas. I'm like, oh, wait, are, are you? You're like the Barabbas? Yeah, yeah, that's me. You know, Barabbas, you know, the, the great picture in the gospel of the one that Jesus took my place, that I was justified by Jesus' death on the cross. Yeah, that, that's me. It'd be so cool. But again, we don't know whether or not Jesus or Barabbas believed in Jesus or not. And there's one final character in the story, and it's not you. There's, there's one character in the story who, who can o alone fulfill the role, and that's Jesus. Only Jesus can be Jesus in this story. There's two presented. They both actually have the name Jesus, the Son of God, but there's one who is clearly the Son of the Father, and he died as though he was a notorious sinner so that he could bring many sons to glory. You know, Jesus loved Barabbas. Jesus died for all. He, divide, he died for the religious. He died for the crowds. He died for Pilate. He died for Pilate's wife. 
You know, maybe you're like Pilate's wife, where something's happened to you recently and you're just like, oh, I got to figure out who this Jesus guy is because he is righteous. And, and if I don't figure out who he is, something's going to happen. Maybe you're like Pilate's wife, but whoever you are, would you consider Jesus, who he is and what he's done for you? Only Jesus can be Jesus, and he is the Savior of all. And this had to happen. See, none of the rulers of this age understood this paradox. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians says. Jesus had to die so that you can be saved. Will you take the freedom? Will you take the release of sin that is offered to you in Jesus' name? It's offered to you today. You can't earn it. All you can do is receive it and be grateful to Jesus for it. Amen? Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you so much for this time. And God, as the gospel has been presented, it is such good news. It it is mind-blowing news, Lord. And I pray right now for anyone here in our midst this evening who could see themselves in this story and realize how much they need Jesus. And if tonight's the night, Lord, If there's anyone in here tonight and you want to receive Jesus tonight as your Lord and Savior, you've never done that before, and tonight's the night where you recognize you're a sinner and you need Jesus to be your Savior, if that's you, would you just raise your hand right where you are? Just right where you are, raise your hand if if you want to receive Christ as Savior today. Okay, see right over here, right over here, praise the Lord. Awesome, anyone else? You want to accept this free gift of pardon to go free and to receive life in the name of Jesus. It's freely given to you. It's right where you are. Praise God. If you would just raise your hand or if in your heart you want to pray this prayer with me, this is just a simple prayer to ask Jesus to be your Lord. Jesus, I thank you that you are perfect. And I recognize today that I'm a sinner. But after hearing this great news, Lord, that you took my place. You died a death that you did not deserve to free me from the one that I deserve. I receive this free gift of pardon, this free gift of grace. Would you be my Lord? Would you be my Savior today? I want to follow you, Jesus. Come and live in me. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to end our time this evening with communion, and we're going to be playing a song during our time of communion. As you're coming forward, I just really encourage you to listen to the words. Um, Talks about how it's never been about performance, it's never been about perfection, it's never been about what you bring and what you can do, it's only by the blood. It's only by the blood that we can be cleansed of our sins, forgiven, set free. And so as you come to these tables to take of the bread and of the cup to remember what Jesus did on that cross for you, take it in thanksgiving. Take it knowing that he alone paid the price for your sin so that you can have freedom in him. Amen. Let's all stand together. We'll close in a song during communion. There's also in the back a table uh, of communion if you need gluten-free, and, but there's four tables here up in the front, and uh, feel free to come as you feel led.
been washed from the inside out. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it was the blood, could it only be in the blood? Hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it was the blood. Nothing's more real than this in the presence of God. Oh, what my heart experienced when my shame at the wayside and my sin at the most high. I was washed from the inside. I was washed from the inside.
Doesn't it feel a little bit like we don't have words to give to Jesus, to express the gratitude that we have for him? 
You know what Jesus did on the cross for us? Um, I don't feel like we could ever put enough words to speak of the magnitude of what happened there on the cross. The fact that just one of my sins was enough for Jesus to be judged on the cross in that way by the Father. But the fact that he took all of our sins, the sins of the world, so that all who would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. What an astounding truth that is. And I pray that you are encouraged in your faith tonight. But we know that the story doesn't end here, right? Jesus died on a Friday. He laid his body lifeless in a tomb. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what we're going to celebrate this Sunday. Amen? Amen. We'll see you all this Sunday. Again, three service times, 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. We hope you invite somebody to come, and we'll have a great day uh, celebrating the resurrected Christ. So we'll see you on Sunday. God bless you guys. Amen.